Ash, welcome. Thanks for having me, Mark. Uh, I want to start by thanking you for your very useful overview of Go dependencies in depth stats. Um, this is not something that I've looked at too much, so it's very useful for me to get up to speed on the state of the art here. Uh, I wanted to kick us off with one question, which is, um, you may have answered towards the end of the talk, but may maybe you could tell us more about the project team or problem you were working on at VMware that prompted the development of Depstat, or was it just with your work on the release team for Kubernetes? Uh, so actually, it's none of that. Uh, when I worked on Depstat, I was neither on the Kubernetes release team, nor was I part of VMware. Uh, so like I said in my talk, uh, Linux Foundation has this mentorship program which anybody can join. And I saw that this project was uh, proposed by one of the maintainers of Kubernetes, Dims. And I applied to that and I got selected. And as part of that project, we sort of like did brainstorming and created this Depstat, which later got merged into the Kubernetes project. That's fantastic. And we're going to come back to the CNCF mentorship program a little bit later. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the, the development process. How long did it take? How many people did you work with, etc.? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the mentorship was a three months thing and we sort of broke it down into pieces. First month was like exploring our needs, right? Like what we needed out of such a tool and what it would do and doing the groundwork of like what internal Go tools we could use and what was existing in the open source world for this kind of solution. Uh, once we did that, the second month was implementation side of things where we, you know, thought that like we, we decided that we would use Cobra to create the actual CLI and stuff. And during this phase, I worked with uh, Dems, who was my mentor, but Alina, who is another Kubernetes contributor, she helped me out. She reviewed my PRs and checked in with code quality and everything. And there were a couple other members like Nabarun, Navid, they helped me get started. And towards the end of the project, like uh, when we were done with the code, we had to sort of integrate it, it into the Kubernetes CI, get it into its repository, make sure that the prow jobs were all ready. And there I worked with Nikita, who's also on the Kubernetes steering committee. She helped me. With everything. So I received a lot of help from a lot of good folks and they all made this project possible. That's brilliant. And I, I think I said we'd come back to the CNCF mentorship program later, but since we're already talking about it, we might as well do that now. You mentioned in your talk um, that you knew very little about Kubernetes when you started, but now you're speaking very authoritatively about it. And that's quite <laughs> impressive considering how complex Kubernetes is. Maybe for any of the people who are listening or watching, you could talk us through how the CNCF mentorship program works in terms of the process. I wouldn't still say that I am uh, very knowledgeable about Kubernetes, but I certainly have a much better idea than when I was getting started. So, but yeah, to answer your question, the way the mentorship program works is that a bunch of projects, open source projects, which are under the CNCF umbrella, their maintainers can sort of propose uh, project ideas or maybe just describe a problem they are facing and then uh, th this is up on the portal and anyone students working professionals can apply and initially before the application you discuss with your mentor what the goals are how you plan to implement it what you know what you can learn and all that sort of stuff and then uh, for each project one student I think gets one person gets selected and then they work with their mentor over a period of three months to develop the project. Perfect. Thank you. Um, in your talk, you mentioned that dependency management may seem uh, trivial for small projects, but that it becomes very important for projects that are the size of Kubernetes. In your experience, at what point in a project's life cycle should people start getting serious about dependency management? So uh, I think if you are develop, uh, I would suggest personally that you start caring about it from day one because you never know the scope of a project, right? You might be starting it as a personal project, but who knows, it provides a lot of value and may grow up to be a super large project. So if you're careful from like uh, day one about your project dependencies, then that would ensure that, you know, once it grows, you do not have lots of problems to deal with. So I would suggest day one is the best time, but yeah, I mean, uh, that does not really happen. So 
the answer would be as soon as possible. Right. So if you're starting a project today and you're listening, start now. If you've already got one running, start yesterday is the advice. <laughs> um, at one point, you showed a very interesting diagram in your presentation, which was the full dependency graph for Kubernetes, which looked uh, <laughs> insane. Um, you mentioned some really useful tools uh, in depth that uh, allows people to navigate this. One is the uh, dash D flag for um, highlighting particular dependencies. There's also the cycles feature, which allows you to discover cyclic dependencies, and then the list function. And all of this is captured in the cron jobs that you showed being run through Prowl. Um, this makes a lot of sense, but now that you're on the Kubernetes uh, release team, maybe you could tell us how the release team acts on the information that they get from the from the Prowl jobs um, as new pull requests are coming in and as you're moving towards cutting a new release. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Kubernetes project is like very large, and so its uh, specific parts are delegated to specific special interest groups, which are abbreviated as SIGs, and a uh, release team does not look into this particular dependency side of things. This is looked by the code organization sub project, which is under SIG architecture, if anyone wants to contribute or just learn. So uh, I just wanted to clear that it has not much to do with the release team stuff, but answering your question, how we look at it is uh, whenever there is a pull request made. So if it's by one of like the frequent contributors, so they know that this job is there. So they would themselves like just go and look, see that like I made all these code changes and what all dependency changes did I end up making. But if it's by some external contributor who's say contributing for the first time, then one of us still has to, you know, point them to that, hey, you can look at this job and see that you are introducing 50 dependencies for a very trivial change. So maybe you want to change your approach a bit. So that is how we keep track of it. And the other way we keep track it is using that cron job, which runs once every six hours. And that helps us in two ways. One, it... Uh, gives us a historical record of how the project dependencies have changed. The other thing it also helps us with is that the time it takes Depstat to produce these statistics, right? So uh, it usually takes like, let's say 20 seconds and suddenly it starts taking 50 seconds. We know that something happened, some PR was merged, which complicated things a lot. So that's how it helps. Thank you. And, um, you know, one of the things that you pulled out as one of the three main reasons for wanting to do something like this is security. How does uh, the work that DepSteps does through the Prowl jobs relate to other things like uh, vulnerability scanning for the projects? Uh, so DepStat specifically does not help with vulnerability scanning, but uh, the way it helps is that if you know that a dependency has been compromised, right? So what you can do and so that might be a direct dependency or it may be rooted very deep in your dependency chain. So what you can do is you can use the dash T flag, which you talked about earlier, and that would show you where that compromised dependency is and how that links to your project. And once you have that uh, link, you can see where to like cut off the main tie so that you get rid of that vulnerable dependency. Got it. So it's a combination of tools. Thanks. Um, one last question. Uh, and this has been surprising me throughout my career. It seems like dependencies and dependency tracking has been a problem with every language I've seen over the last, I don't remember how many years. Why do, why do you think this still isn't like an out of the box solved problem for a relatively new language like Go? I think it's mostly because of like the changing nature of it right now. And uh, Go did a lot of things nicely and it's still trying to do. But uh, so if you, read the release docs for Go 117, they have sort of changed the behavior of how Go mod graph, which is like the underlying command for devstat works. And uh, which I feel like is a direction which, you know, like they constantly keep reevaluating it. And um, to be honest, I do not have an actual answer here for like mm -hmm. <laughs> why there is no out of box solution here. But I think it's because of like the ever changing nature of dependencies in general and that makes sense thank you well that's all we've got time for today but i want to thank you again for your very insightful talk i enjoyed it a lot and learned a lot from it and i'm really pleased to hear that cncf mentorship program was valuable for you good luck with your future work with the kubernetes uh, uh, release team and we hope to hear from you next time thank you for having me
It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks to Microsoft Azure and Equinix Metal for supporting us at the champion level. We also want to thank Red Hat and Slim.ai for funding us at our supporter level.